Okay, I think we're ready to go. You ready? I am. So I'll just count us down and we'll just jump into it. Three. Hey, welcome everybody. Jeff Frick here coming to you from the home office here in Palo Alto. Uh, excited for another episode of Turn the Lens. And we've got uh, a really interesting character coming to us from all the way the other side of the world uh, who's been involved in the data science space, both from an educational point of view as well as an academic point of view, life scientist. And now he's got a new role. So we're happy to uh, welcome from across the pond through the magic of the internet and Zoom. He's Hugo Bound Anderson, the head of data science evangelism and marketing for Coiled. Hugo, great to see you. Jeff, thank you so much for having me on the show. And it's great to be here. Absolutely. So just a quick check in. How are you getting by during these crazy times? I think uh, the end is 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 starting to come in sight. But um, how are you getting by? I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, um, we've uh, not done so well on the vaccine rollout here, but it's getting a lot better currently back in back in lockdown, but high hopes for the future as well. And, right. you know, staying optimistic. All right, great. Well, let's jump into it. So for the people that didn't do the research before before the before the interview, give them a little uh, breakdown of what Coiled is all about. Give them the Coiled 101. So at Coiled, we're building products to help data scientists and organizations burst to the cloud. Uh, essentially, we're born from the open source software ecosystem in, in Pythonic data science. We understand the needs of the enterprise, which involve deploying and productionizing a lot of large models on large data sets. There's a lot of challenges associated with this. And we want to abstract those challenges away so that data scientists and organizations can get back to the work that they do best. And the okay. product we're building is around the Pythonic data science space and a package called Dask in particular. Okay, so for people that aren't familiar with kind of the progression between, you know, kind of what is, what is Python, what is Dask, what is Coiled, and how do those pieces all fit together? Give us a quick kind of <clears throat> overview. So Python is a language that has grown, a programming language that has grown so rapidly over the past, you know, five to 10 years in, in particular for both data science and for web frameworks. But we're focusing on the data science aspect, aspect here. So what we have now is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people uh, using Python for data science work, and they're prototyping all of their stuff on, on their laptops, essentially. And the big disconnect is between getting stuff prototyped on your laptop and getting it in production, getting applications running uh, on the cloud or on big clusters on-prem. On so the whole point is that once you wanna to scale to do uh, your deployed data analysis, data science, machine learning, AI, uh, you wanna work with bigger data, bigger models, more cores. This involves a lot more headache in terms of bursting to the cloud, getting all your Dockers set up there or your Kubernetes, that, that type of stuff. Um, and at that point, uh, coil, coiled comes in. I should step back a bit and say Dask comes in at the point where you want to scale your workflow to bigger data and, and, and bigger models. And then when you're wanting to do it on, on the cloud at scale, that's when Dask comes in, when Coiled comes in. Okay, so make sure I understand. So you've got, you got Python, which is kind of the fundamental, you know, kind of open source software package for doing data science. Then you've so got. It's a particular subset of Python. It's really the, the Pi data stack. So your NumPy's, your Pandas's, okay. scikit-learn for machine learning. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for that clarification. And then Dask is really designed to parallelize Python for bigger jobs. Absolutely. Okay. And then Coiled is then to basically help enterprises implement Dask. Is that accurate? Exactly, enterprises and organizations more generally. And organizations. Now it's interesting, right? Because you, you before you became, you know, you're in the business world. You were actually in the academic world, and you were doing research. I think in molecular biology. It's yeah, way cell above biology, my biophysics. Yeah. So I mean, so from a data scientist perspective, you talk about the problems that you guys are fixing now. If you can step back into your role as a data scientist and, and and you know, kind of talk about what were these things and how did they manifest themselves in your, you know, your kind of day to day job, or were you running into these? types of restrictions I, I was running into them and everyone i worked with was running running into them and that's kind of why i'm, I'm so excited about the work we're, we're doing now so to go back to that story i was working in cell biology and biophysics uh first uh there's a big max Planck institute for cell biology and genetics in dresden uh then i moved to the east coast to work uh in on, on similar questions at yale university in, in new haven connecticut and in all honesty, working with cell biologists, seeing that there were all these tools they could use, but they didn't know how to use them, how to access them, how to choose them. As we know, you know, the attention economy has created a, a, a content landscape in which it's virtually impossible to see, you know, 
to reduce uh, the, the noise so you can get signal on where to find the tools, tools you need. And I saw this happen time and time again. I saw grad schools leave, grad students leave their programs. Um, I saw tenured professors not be able to publish papers uh, because of the timelines involved um, and, and the lack of access to, to tooling. So what I thought would be a great project is to figure out how to get the right tools to the right people. And so I started running in-person workshops at both these uh, institutions. Around the same time, uh, I, I met a few entrepreneurs who just started a startup called Data Camp, uh, and they were building online data science education, uh, particularly in the R programming language. They were looking for someone to build out the Python curriculum, as well as doing a lot of internal data science and product management and that, that type of stuff. That seemed like an incredible opportunity um, to reach a lot of people, particularly with the open source Python, Pythonic data science uh, stack. So I, I jumped on board uh, and I was there for four, just over four years. Um, I was very fortunate to be in the right place at, at the right time at a, a company which enabled the courses I created along with the ones that I created externally uh, with external in instructors to reach over half, half a million uh, learners worldwide. Uh, and the next step, of course, after these types of B2C offerings is figuring out how to, how to uh, get this tooling system and ecosystem into the hands of the enterprise. And when I started chatting with Matt Rocklin, who created Dask and was thinking about building a company that turned out to be coiled, um, it was an it was an opportunity that was too good to to, to not take up, uh, particularly as it happened when COVID um, kind of really started hitting last last March and April. Right, right. I want I want to dig down into a little bit. You know, you talk about the frustration of the data scientists and people leaving their programs and not being able to publish their papers. I mean, what what was the fundamental problem? Was the tools were just not available? Did they not have access to them? Had they not even been purchased were the rights and restrictions too hard or the process to get on them i mean what what was the big problem that 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 was getting in the way and how are you guys you know with coiled uh, helping to make sure that doesn't happen in the future because data science is such a huge part of our future uh, ai is always talked about as the most important thing since the internet in terms of transformational technology uh you're actually talking about the people that write the algorithms you know at the heart of this stuff so what was this big problem that was frustrating them so bad that they couldn't they couldn't use the tools that they needed um the first problem is awareness so for example, uh, the Python PSF, Python Software Foundation, did a survey uh, last year in, in which Python users responded that around 5% of Python users use Dask. One in 20 Python users, which number millions, right, use Dask. And people say, that that's amazing. And my question is, why is it only 5%? If you think maybe half the people are doing data analysis, data science-y type of stuff, um, and then half of them probably need to uh, generalize their CPU intensive workflows or work with medium sized data sets. Um, and, and the answer is not everyone knows about Dask still, right? And similarly with a lot of the tooling out there. So firstly, there's an awareness problem. Then on top of that, there's an education problem. Even if you have heard about Dask, where do you find the curriculum to actually learn it? They don't teach it at college, right? Um, and a lot of working professionals, they're not in college anymore. They're trying to upskill while working full-time jobs as well. Um, and the third challenge is infrastructure to make it as easily usable as possible, which is exactly what we're working on at Coiled. So the awareness and education part, uh, I worked on a lot at Data Camp. Um, the, and the education awareness and infrastructure part is what I'm really interested in at Coiled. And what, what, what I mean by that is running Dask on your own laptop, really smooth experience. If you want to get up and running on the cloud on AWS, GCP or Azure, you've got to set up your account, your credentials, authentication, then you've got to use Kubernetes and Dockerization. And then suddenly you're a part-time software engineer or DevOps engineer, and you're not even doing doing the job that, that you're paid to, right? So we abstract right. all of that away. Right, right. I was, I was going to say, um, you know, kind of how has cloud, you know, changed the game? And it was, is, is cloud the big motivation so people can run really big jobs and get them off their laptop? Is that what you see is kind of really the big, the big catalyst here? Cloud and on-prem um, HPC as, as well, right? So cloud, I think, is a general term for, you know, computation that doesn't happen here uh, locally. And that may be one of the common cloud providers. 
or you might work for an organization um, that has, you know, huge on, on-prem clusters. So right, e- right. exactly right. Right. So one of the big frustration things that comes up is, you know, you're talking about these poor people that can't get their 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 stuff going, right? It's just it's the simple, ugly stuff about like provisioning and getting allocated resources and, you know, all these things to get a piece of infrastructure to run your, to run your big job. And uh, I've talked to Matt before and he, he talked about kind of a classic use case where someone will test an algorithm on a relatively small data set, get it to where they want it. And then now they want to pump in and, you know, a massive data set and apply that, apply that model. Potential problem with the cloud is governance, right? Um, and we hear all the time of people accidentally leaving a switch open. It's usually not a physical problem, but, but it's a user error. So there's, there's big potential um, cost implications of misuse of, of cloud infrastructure. So I presume that, that from the IT point of view, these are some of the features that they really want to make sure that, that, that they've got in place in your product. Jeff, you are speaking my language. So our three major stakeholders um, in terms of the product, our our, our coiled cloud product are individual contributors, IT, uh, and and then team leads. And maybe I can just break it down into each of those um, very briefly. We've talked a bit about individual contributors who a lot of people may think that's your number one stakeholder. In a sense, that's absolutely right. But if IT isn't happy, uh, then it's very unlikely that your product will be adopted by that, by that organization. Okay. Right, right. So as we've discussed for individual contributors, and as you discussed with, with, with Matt Rocklin, they'll be prototyping on a laptop, right? Uh, then they either want to deploy uh, the, or productionize their, their models and data applications, or they'll want to move to bigger data and bigger models and leverage more cores. Uh, and essentially in the end, they'll want to burst to the cloud. And this introduces a lot of headache, the type of things I talked about, which turned them into de facto ML ops engineers or DevOps engineers. Then we have IT. And as you spoke to, when an individual contributor is trying to deploy their data application or put in production, suddenly we need security, authentication. Uh, you mentioned cost, which is one of the biggest concerns, the need for IT to be able to shut down something that's happening and draining a huge amount of budget, right? And for that reason, of course, we've made Coiled and Enterprise Ready to solve these security concerns, authentication concerns. Of course, the huge one, the shutdown concerns as well. The third stakeholder I, I, I spoke to were team leads who have some similar concerns from a slightly different perspective to uh, IT. They also require visibility into everything that's happening. They need to keep an eye on cost. Uh, they also uh, are very interested in enabling in enabling collaboration. So what's happening as data science team scale and data functions and organizations scale uh, is that you get a lot of people duplicating work essentially in different teams. Your mm. growth team team may be working on a database and creating features that another team is doing as well. That's why we're seeing a lot of feature store action happening at the moment as well, actually. But the whole point um, is that team leads require visibility into everything that's happening. And for that reason, um, we provide advanced telemetry for them to be able to do so. Um, So to recap, the three stakeholders are IC, individual contributors, uh, IT and team leads. Yeah. And I, and I would imagine IT is the most important in terms of you guys getting paid and you guys getting, uh, you know, implemented and you guys getting deployed. Um, Anyone can a block a deal, site. Jeff. What's that? Anyone can block a deal. Right? Yeah, exactly. IT is key, but anyone can block a deal. That's true. That's true. Well, let's shift gears a little bit about something more positive than, than deal blocking. Talk about <laughs> your role as an evangelist. I think it's one of the coolest titles um, in tech to, to, to have that opportunity to, to be an evangelist. So, Talk a little bit about, you know, what do you do day to day? Uh, what's kind of the role of the evangelism? And you also have the marketing hat as well. So that's pretty good because a large part of marketing is telling stories and and out talking to the people. So tell us a little bit about your, you know, kind of day to day and the role of an evangelist at Coiled. Look, evangelism and what's also referred to as developer relations or DevRel, I think is one of the most important things happening at the moment. We see the long tail of of data infrastructure companies. You can go and look at the data and AI landscapes that Matt Turk has has put out. You can see how crowded the space is becoming and developer relations and evangelism is a way to give people who are looking for tools higher signal in this really full on information landscape we have have currently, right? So my job is to increase signal to ra- signal to noise ratio uh, in, in content for people who may be interested in, in using Coiled, right? So what, what does that involve? That involves 
telling the stories of Dask users and, and, and coiled users. And that's really cool for me because as you know, um, I love this space. I love all the stories. I love the scientists. So being able to do live streams or webinars or write blog posts about all the cool stuff people are using these tools for, whether it's at you know, NASA or Harvard Medical School or Capital One or Walmart, right? Uh, it's, it's that part of my job is super exciting. On top of that, correlated with that, is generally advocating for the open source ecosystem, um, which as, as as you know, and I, I think as your viewers now know, is something that really, really excites me and gets me out of bed uh, every morning with a smile on my face. Um, the other key part is breaking down the space into digestible chunks, okay? So making sure that if someone, you know, is trying to figure out how to repartition a Dask data frame, right? And I, I appreciate, a lot of your viewers may not know, know what that means, but that's part of the point, right? It's a pretty technical thing to do. But if someone's trying to trying to find find that, I, I want to make sure that that information is available. Um, so thinking about people all through the Pythonic data science stack funnels, so to speak, and that's where my marketing hat kind of, you know, I've started using terms like funnel, Jeff. Um, <laughs> the funnel and, and is your friend. The funnel is your friend. Conversion rates. Um, but <laughs> all, all, all that aside, um, breaking down the space into digestible chunks, vertical use cases, individual use cases, diff different parts of the ecosystem. When do you use machine learning? And when do you use statistical inference? What does Anaconda do? What does Coil do? What, what do these other companies do? Trying to, trying to um, describe the space when most people can't see the, see the forest for the trees. So part of my job is to describe the forest, which right. is pretty exciting. So do you focus mainly on, um, you know, the, the, the giant Python ecosystem of which you said a relatively small percent is even using something like DAS to, to go after them to enlighten them on the potential? Or is it people that are kind of outside the Pythonic <laughs> ecosystem, as you say, that, that, that maybe you're trying to evangelize that, hey, maybe you should consider this technology stack versus a different technology stack for your your AI and ML needs? I think in the end, everything's fair game. At the moment though, um, we're particularly interested in targeting users and, and, and companies who already use Python. They may not be super Dask sophisticated, but let's say they're using scikit-learn for machine learning, which is a really popular and, and fascinating and incredible uh, open source package for machine learning. A lot of them are doing like these large scale ensemble models and hyper parameter sweeps and big grid searches and that type of stuff. And when they're doing that, they come up against compute intensive issues where their workflow could run for hours. And so part of my job is to let them know that Dask in, is an option for them to distribute it locally and, and in the cloud. So it's really the, the, the Pythonic users currently, but in the end, if there are R users, for example, um, or people using MATLAB who would find this find this useful. Um, I'd love to have those conversations at some point. Okay, well, let's have let, let so share with us. I know you're passionate about the topic. Share with us a couple of, of of stories of where this technology is being used to make a difference in the world. Yeah, so I'll give two very different examples. Uh, one is at Walmart, which I love this example because supply chain analytics and 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 product forecasting is you know as as old as data science, as far as I'm concerned. In the mid 20th century, Walmart was doing a lot of exciting stuff there. The other example is from cell, uh, cell, cell biology and microscopy. So we'll get to that in, in a second. Um, but Dask is, is used at Walmart for product forecasting of over 500 million store item combinations over a 52 week horizon. So they use machine learning, or they use something called XGBoost in particular, they use GPUs, they use Dask, massive data sets, um, and Rapids, which is from in, 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 in NVIDIA. Uh, and what this has done is their product uh, forecasting is a hundred times faster. So it can happen, what used to happen on the order of several weeks uh, can, can happen in un, under a day now, which allows them to make decisions far more quickly, but also allows them, one of the big, one of the big things um, are ex external events impacting product forecasting, whether it be weather, for example. So if right. the weather changes, they can do that in a split second, as opposed to waiting several days to get those results in. Interesting. And then what was the other one? The other one was more scientific, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So this is really exciting for me because the users, it's um, it's a tool called Napari. 
Uh, and the people who use it don't even need to know anything about Dask, which is awesome. It even abstracts over Dask. So the, the challenge is that you have uh, cell biologists who need to do interactive exploration of high resolution cellular microscopy of high res images, which can be hundreds of gigabytes, right? So they need to do all these transformations and pre-processing, looking at it from different angles, this type of stuff. The data sets are so big that if they wanted to do one of these transformations or pre-processing previously, and when I was at um, the Max Planck Institute, I saw people do this, they'd do all their pre-processing, then come back the next day and look at it, and then do a bit more pre-processing or another experiment, come back the next day, and look at it, right? Now with Dask, it parallelizes massively all these operations in the back end. So in Napari, they have sliders. They can just move a slider and do this in real time, which essentially means they stay in a flow state with their work and uh, don't need to wait days in order to break up their work in, in, into those chunks. So the gains in productivity there for them are exceptional. And I mean, it's Napari is used all over the place now. They use it at, um, Harvard Medical School on the East Coast, as well as Chan Zuckerberg Initiative on, on the West and a whole variety of places in, in, in between as well. So that's yeah. an example that's, that's close to my heart and impacting basic research today. Right. I wonder if you could drill a little bit in, into this kind of this role of open source with, with a commercial entity, because you know it's, it's, a, it's an unparalleled driver of innovation. We know that across all the different open source projects and things can just run. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, open source is free like a puppy. You, know, you still have training and integration and, and all kinds of other stuff on, on, on kind of a pure open source. So there's a really great opportunity for a company like Coiled, but you're still very active in the open source community and there's still a ton of innovation in the open source community. And you've got this giant library or, 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 or excuse me, population of libraries that you can pull from. So I know you're passionate about kind of the magic that can happen with the combination of open source and a commercial entity. I wonder if you can give a little more, more color there. Yeah, absolutely. There are several ways to slice this. And the first is um, the fact that I feel on average, and this is a massive generalization, but on average, open source is incredible at meeting the needs of individual users, but not equipped to meet the needs of enterprises, right? So you can imagine, um, you know, if you think of an organization or a company as, as a graph, it meets the needs of nodes, but not necessarily the edges, such as communication between IC and IT and team leads, as we've, as we've discussed. To drill a bit deeper into that, one of the reasons I think that's the case, and this is one of the reasons Python has been so impactful, is that the open source packages in Py Python data science weren't, for the most part, built by software engineers. They were built by research scientists and users who needed them for particular tasks, right? Um, and so, you know, Matthew Rockland's background is in, in, in physics, right? Um, uh, Brian Granger and Fernando Perez, who built IPython and Project Jupiter, Jupiter Notebooks. Um, they're acad academic basic science researchers, uh, uh, among other things. Uh, Wes McKinney was working on his problems to, to come up with Pandas, right? Um, Travis Oliphant, similar for NumPy. So the point of, of kind of that slight um, detour was to demonstrate that this is the reason open source is so good at meeting the needs of individuals, but we don't necessarily have um, large scale organizational uh, adoption because it won't meet those all of those needs that we've discussed. Right, right. It's funny you say that. I saw a TED talk with Linus Torvalds from from Linux fame, and love he, Linus. He specifically said just what you said. He said, "You know, I've never built anything that I didn't just want to build for myself." Yeah. Um, and then he was fascinated when everybody else happened to have the same need and invested time and energy in the same problem. That is so key, and that that raises another point that I think is very key in this conversation is the bus factor of. Uh, these th these packages, the amount of, of people who you would not put on the same bus, right, in case it, it went down. There's maybe, you know, I, I can't remember what the number is, but on the order of 10 people who contribute so much to the, to the Pi data stack, right? And if an enterprise requires certain things from that community, how do they actually get them? So, and, and it's, it's absolutely unclear. And whether the open source community should be responsive um, to enterprises like that. So that's why I think uh, one solution is the evolution of companies such as Coiled to be the connective tissue between open source and, and, and the enterprise. And that's why it's key that such companies as we are, are, are born from, from the open source with people who have 
you know, very um, a, a part of the deep open source community as well. Right, right. Very exciting. So you guys recently uh, put some more money in the bank, which is great. So you got a little bit more uh, powder to work with. So as yep. we, you know, you look for it, I can't believe we're already halfway through with 2021, which is ridiculous. But what, um, you know, what are some of your goals for the balance of the year? You've got got some extra funding and, you know, you're it's kind of another, you know, step, a, a step function in, in your guys process. What are you looking forward to? What are your priorities? What are you working on? So, one of the things I'm most excited about is that Coiled has has doubled down in the way it's contributing to the back to the open source community. I think, which is as we've spoken to this this kind of tension um, b- between uh, open source and enterprise. So we're hiring a, a bunch of people who are pretty much full time working on on Dask and and related technologies, which, which is incredible. A lot more engineers to to work on the product as as well. Um, what I'm really excited about is getting out there um, as we enter the post-COVID world and actually meeting a lot of users and, and speaking with them and developing content and material for them and, and by them as, as well. And once again, telling t- telling more, more of those stories. Good, good. Well, Hugo, your passion comes through, your your excitement for the space and for the uh, for the technology and for more importantly the solutions that it can that it can deliver, uh, really shines through. So, congratulations to you and the team for getting through twenty twenty. Started the company right at the beginning of twenty twenty, right? It's crazy. Exactly. Uh, probably wasn't part of the plan. No. <laughs> but but and now and now you got some money, so uh, I think you guys are in a very very good position. As as I said, everyone everyone. John Chambers, the list goes on and on. You know, AI is the most important thing that's ever happened uh, since the internet, and it's going to be used all over the place in so many applications. But <laughs> as you said somebody's got to write the algorithm. It just doesn't happen by uh, by accident or, or or just by magic, right? Someone's got to sit down and actually do the work and figure. Yeah, out and we want to help the people who have to write the algorithm write it, so they don't have I to do it. all the other stuff. I love it. I love it, and test it, and this and that. Yeah. All right. Well, Hugo, thanks for uh, for taking a few minutes out of your busy day. And uh, it's thanks, always yeah. great to catch up and great to see you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. And it's always great to chat. All right. Me too. And uh, stay safe and be well. All right. He's Hugo. I'm Jeff. You're watching Turn the Lens with Jeff Frick. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.